with all the anger and really vicious rhetoric starting to come from one side of the political spectrum, the anti-Semites crawled out of the dark corners and crawled out of their holes. They coalesced, of course, on the Internet. Journalists with Jewish names were targeted, identified as Jews, and vilified. And pretty soon, this sort of rhetoric, words, images, you name it, began to cross into the mainstream. And of course, Jews were far from alone, usually not even the primary targets of these haters. Vitriol and hate against African Americans, against Muslims, against Latinos, and especially against immigrants flooded into the culture. And it went largely unopposed, sometimes was even spread by the most important figures in one of our mainstream political parties. Then in 2016, reports of anti-Semitic incidents went way up. In 2017, they spiked. It was the largest year-over-year increase ever in reported hate crimes against Jews. And there was violence. Violence with racist and political underpinnings. Just one example of many. A racist man who wrapped himself, literally wrapped himself in the Confederate flag, killed nine beautiful souls at a Bible study group at the Mother Emanuel Church in the South. And then, of course, came Charlottesville. The Unite the Right rally there in August of 2017. The street riots and the killing of Heather Heyer by a Nazi racist thug in his car. And there was that march, that march the night before. Hundreds of these well-dressed young white men carrying torches through the community and the campus chanting, Jews will not replace us. There was a small group of others brandishing assault rifles standing outside a synagogue there in Charlottesville, just standing there with their weapons, sending a message of intimidation and threatened violence. Those things gave me a sick, kind of cold feeling. A large, torch-carrying group of men yelling anti-Semitic slogans, others there to support them and cheer them on. This did not feel to me like the America that I grew up in, the country I grew up in, feeling safe and secure to be who I was, to bring my family to worship services, to express who we were publicly, any way we wanted. Well, yes, this was America in 2017 and 2018. And there was the president, the president of the United States, commenting on those events in Charlottesville. After being forced, you could tell, into a statement condemning the violence and murder, he didn't want to make that statement, you could just tell, blaming what happened on people, quote, on both sides. Now, I really hate sports analogies, but I can't help it here. I mean, condemning, rioting neo-Nazis and racists and their supporters has got to be the easiest ground ball you'll ever get in politics. And the president didn't just fail to make the play. He didn't just make a mistake. He really showed where he stood by backtracking on his more conciliatory statement that he'd been kind of forced into. The Nazis who came to Charlottesville to start trouble, foment violence, make threats, and actually inflict violence were not fully to blame for what happened. And some of those people there were, quote, very fine people and not Nazis at all, just people concerned with statues of Robert E. Lee. And now, a year and a couple of months later, we have this. Eleven souls murdered in Shabbat services in synagogue, murdered by a man saying that Jews must all Die. A man who posted on social media that Jews uh, through the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society were responsible for bringing the so called caravan of Central American immigrants toward our borders, quote, to kill our people. 
Motivated by these, quote, facts, he wrote on the Gab platform, quote, I can't sit by and watch my people get slaughtered. Screw your optics. I'm going in. Close quote. Not very long after that, this anti-Semitic troll took an AR-15 and multiple handguns to Tree of Life Synagogue and slaughtered Jews at prayer because they were Jews, just the way that Dylan Roof slaughtered black people in Bible study at Mother Emanuel because they were black. I heard an interview in the last day or so on National Public Radio with the CEO who runs that platform called Gab, a sort of Twitter for folks who feel they're unwelcome on Twitter itself and other platforms where they've been banned for using hate speech and violent rhetoric. Uh, he defended Gab. Uh, it doesn't allow threats, he said, and he saw no, quote, direct threat in what the synagogue killer had said. Now, this might best be described as willful obtuseness. The killer's statement means, in case anybody needs an explanation, the killer is saying in plain English, anyone can understand, quote, I don't care how this looks. I'm going to take action. The Gab manager knows this, just like the rest of us. Then he and the reporter uh, began to argue about censorship. The Gab CEO said censorship isn't the answer. The answer to bad speech, he says, is always more speech. Now, that's right. Without a hint of irony or even the barest awareness of history or context, this guy quoted the great Jewish Supreme Court Justice, Louis Brandeis, in his famous opinion in Whitney versus California. Unbelievable. But I was actually quite disturbed by this whole conversation, the entire report, because the issue isn't censorship. The issue isn't what the law or the government should do about this sort of hate speech and this sort of rhetoric. The First Amendment says that we can only block or stop speech when it creates an immediate threat of violence or incitement to violence. But that's really not the issue here. What we need is for everyone, the guy who runs Gab, the president of the United States, every political figure to acknowledge that words have meaning and consequences. Words can move people to violence, to acts of hate, and can indicate that real danger is present. So, Gab CEO guy, fine, don't censor but call it out. And when someone says they're, quote, going in, they're going to take action. Do something. Alert the authorities. All of us have to call out hatred and bigotry and calls for violence and announcements of violence. We must not tolerate this. and We must not give it the assumption that it's normal. When a mainstream political figure watches his supporters beat people at one of his political events and then gives his approval, it's not normal, it's not acceptable, and it has to be called out, even by that political figure's supporters. When a president praises a congressman who assaulted a reporter during his campaign for having the audacity to ask him a question, that praise is not normal, not acceptable, must be called out. You know, I can tell you here about the law. We can, we can talk about hate crimes and what they do and how to prove them. We could talk about laws protecting speech. We can talk about what we might do to control gun use by those who pose a danger. But in my opinion, that isn't what the problem is right now. It has to become unacceptable again to say our political opponents or the press are the enemies 
of our country. It has to be unacceptable, not normal, to use the rhetoric of hate to describe those with whom we disagree. And all of those who preach hate, who use violence, who threaten violence, who use the rhetoric of violence, must be called out as wrong and beyond the pale. 